So, welcome. How's everybody doing today? Oh, well, boy, it's getting, it's just like this, we should graph this. It's like going down, it's like more, uh, than, well, welcome. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. I just wanted to show a little clip of this thing. It's one of these great examples of real, honest-to-goodness social behavior. Uh, and in, in the middle part of the lecture, I'll kind of talk a little bit more about what you saw there um, and kind of why it's interesting. So today, what I want to talk about is sort of continue on, uh, again, talking about social psychology, give you a taste of what this field is really all about. Um, and uh, today, kind of, you know, kind of using this, this concept of uh, sociality and ultra sociality to try to explain how it is that we're so both attuned to other people and therefore affected by social situations. So we're going to talk about this idea of ultra sociality, a little phenomenon called the chameleon effect. We'll talk about, I'll use it as kind of an excuse to, to give you a, a very quick primer on uh, uh, psychological research on emotion, again with kind of a social uh, emphasis, and then we'll talk about uh, a little bit uh, about group dynamics, trying to illustrate three effects that groups of people have on us, that they cause arousal, they cause anonymity, and they cause extremity. And give an example of each of those. Hopefully I can get through all this stuff uh, as we go today. So first I just want to give you, I want to read you something and have you tell me what you think this is about. So this is just Oh, I want you to get your clickers out today too, not right for right now, but you're, we're going to start doing the clicker stuff uh, today, so hopefully you all have your clickers with you. So let me read you this, and I want you to just think about it and tell me what you think this paragraph is about. I believe that very few men are capable of estimating the immense amount of torture and agony which this dreadful punishment, prolonged for years, inflicts upon the sufferers. And in guessing at it myself and in reasoning from what I have seen written upon their faces and what to my certain knowledge they feel within, I am only the more convinced that there is a depth of terrible endurance in which none but the sufferers themselves can fathom and which no man has a right to inflict upon his fellow creature. I showed this, I hold this slow and daily tampering with the mysteries of the brain to be immeasurably worse than any torture of the body. And because its ghastly signs and tokens are so, not so palpable to the eye and sense of touch as scars upon the flesh, because its wounds are not upon the surface and it exhorts few cries that human ears can hear, therefore the more I denounce it as a secret punishment which slumbering humanity is not roused up to stay. Who can tell me what they think this is about? What he's describing here, he or she is describing here. Go ahead. Bingo. It's wonderful. People usually guess all around it. What's your name? What's your name? Uh, Rami. Rami? Yeah. Okay. okay. I don't, I'm not going to write you down or anything, but I mean, I, I forgot last time. I really want to start at least trying to get some of your names. So when you raise your hand, I'm going to start trying to ask your name. Of course, I already forgot Rami, but uh, something like that. I'll forget him by the end of the quarter or by the end of the day anyway. Um, but I'm going to work on it. So, actually, this is written by Charles Dickens, and it was about solitary confinement, right? So we hear a lot about torture these days, you know, in, in, in the news and about the, the moral debate that goes on. Uh, it, solitary confinement is something that's used every day all over prisons in the United States. They put people in rooms all by themselves, right, deprive them of human contact. It's, one of the most horrible things you could do to somebody to deprive them of human contact. You would think, oh, well, I'd much rather be beaten, right? I mean, I'd rather, I'd rather, I'd rather not be, be, I'd rather be put in a, in a cell by myself than I would be, you know, physically beaten or tortured in some way, waterboarded. But solitary confinement is a really terrible thing to do to people. It has all sorts of documented terrible effects, so it causes anxiety and headaches, chronic tiredness, trouble sleeping, and nervous breakdowns, uh, hands, palpitations, loss of appetite, uh, nightmares, uh, perceptual distortions, chronic depression, right? It's a really terrible thing. So why, why would it be that separating people out from other people is such a terrible thing? It starts to tell you how important other people are to us, how deeply social we really are. 
right? And there's been lots of research on just solitary confinement and what it does, but there's uh, been other sort of psychological research on, on even sort of more minimal kind of manipulations of uh, excluding people from others. And, uh, it's a, so a whole bunch of interesting studies that are done on this phenomenon, it's called social exclusion. Uh, and they do these uh, laboratory studies and they'll do simple things like they'll tell people, uh, they'll have people get together, they're in a, uh, they have them have an interaction with six people uh, very often or you know, with the other group of people and very often they aren't people who are real or, or you know, the, you know, the, but it doesn't really matter. You put people in a group and you have them talk and then you take them, they separate the, the people out and then they, they, they say, well, what we're going to do, we want you to nominate we wanted you to kind of get to know each other, now we want you to nominate the, the people who you want to work with in a group discussion, right? And so everybody does that. They're, they're all now in separate rooms. And then they go back to the people and they go, you know, nobody chose you. Right, all those other people, nobody chose you, right? People have this kind of response. Another thing they'll do is they'll do a personality, they'll give people a fake personality test. And they'll come back and they say, you know, you're destined to be the kind of person who spends the, the rest of their life more or less alone, right? That's what you're destined for. Even simpler things, this funny little phenomena they call cyberball. So they get people, uh, put people in a situation where they are, uh, again, even on the internet, and they, 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 they've done these studies on the internet. It was uh, actually inspired by, uh, it's, a, it's an old friend of mine, Kip uh, Williams, who uh, did these studies, and he tells the story of how he started to do these studies on social ostracism. And he was, uh, one day he was at the beach, and he went down, and some guys were playing frisbee, and he said, hey dudes, can I play? And they go, yeah, you know, so they started to throw the frisbee around, and then after a little while, the two guys, you know, so it goes one, two, three, one, two, three, around, and all of a sudden the guys just started throwing the Frisbee back and forth to each other and not throwing it to him. And he's just sort of standing there and he's going, and he just he noticed how immediately, did, how it affected him so emotionally to be ostracized like that. So these kinds of manipulations, if, you're gonna, if you just sort of toy a little bit with people's sense of whether other people like them and that, get, get, give them the sense that they're being excluded, has been documented to have this huge number of really sort of troubling effects on people. So people, if they're excluded compared to people who aren't excluded, tend to uh, show increased aggression if you give them a chance to aggress against somebody. They show reduced helpfulness. So if you're asked, you give them a chance to, to help in some task and they won't help, they won't be cooperative. Uh, they, they don't regulate themselves as much. They'll, in other words, they'll be more likely to uh, you know, uh, be impulsive uh, and do something that's sort of a, for a short-term gain uh, rather than a long-term uh, loss. So it lowers their actual intelligence on an intelligence test. It makes you stupider, right? It makes, it, it makes your reasoning poor. It causes an emotional numbness, a reduced sensitivity to pain. Lower empathy, they don't feel the pain of other people as much. And of course, what they want to do is it, it leads to a greater seeking of friends and perceiving other people as people who might want to be friends with you. Right? So when you separate people from other people, it has a host of really negative effects. And again, that's the idea that I really want to stress to you today, is how important other people are to us, right? And how deeply attuned we are to other people, how our niche in the evolutionary scheme is a social niche, it's these small groups, right? And this is all tied up in a deep sense in, in uh, uh, what social cycle psychology and its, its worldview, right? And in fact, humans are unique, really, in the sense in which they are social. In fact, uh, a couple of different sort of intellectual traditions have uh, talked about, let me turn this down a little bit, um, have talked about this idea of ultra-sociality. that people are, the first person to really talk about this was Emile Durkheim, a very famous uh, sociologist. Uh, more recently, it's been talked about by a guy named John Hyde, a collaborator and friend of mine, who's uh, you know, sort of made this point that people are essentially hive creatures, 
right? There's only a few animal species that are have this. Many animal species hang out together, right? They move in pods or bands or whatever kind of groups, but few of them are sort of deeply, deeply social. Insects are, right? Ants in particular, where they're so, their whole niche in life is to be part of a group, to work together, and they work intimately with a group, right? Even to the extent that the worker bees don't need the, feel the need to mate, right? So they, they, they allocate mating to uh, a queen, right? right? This is something that, that's the sort of ultimate goal, right, in, in human existence. We'll talk more about this, right? Is you have to carry your genes on to the next gene, to, you know, to the, in the gene pool, right, to the next generation. But these, there's some animals that are just so tightly connected, right, so social, right, that their whole niche is they act kind of like one big super organism. And humans are really like that. They have very similar qualities. It's hard not to see some kind of a similarity, people moving together in this way. Every time when I look up at cities, I look up, drive to the lagoon and I look up and I go, it looks like a hive. Right? It look, all the houses all niched together, right? We look like a, that, that, that's, the, that's the human niche, right? Evolutionarily, we are these ultra social kinds of creatures, right? And it's really important to understand, right, that that's our, and how, and that's our niche in, in, in the world, and that profoundly affects our psychology, right? The way we behave. And you think you're this individual, you think. Again, you do what you want, but you don't do what you want nearly as much as you think, right? We're connected in this way. And those, this idea of sociality and the idea of situationism are really related to one another, right? So just to kind of tie these together conceptually, right? So the idea of well, these key lessons of social psychology that I will stress in here, right? People are social animals. Our evolutionary niche, our strategy survival is group life. So humans are weak little critters, right? We don't do well all by ourselves. So very early on in our evolutionary history, we realized that we function better in groups, that we are, our survival really depends against other kinds of predators, against uh, you know, lots of things is to live in these groups. So we're deeply social in that sense. And of course, the other lesson that we learn from social psychology is that we're, our behavior is deeply affected by situations. And again, those two go together. The reason we're affected by situations, right, is because most situations are people. When we talk about situations, we're talking about different social situations that we're in. And so our behavior changes when we change the people that we're around, right? We do different things. We, not only do we do different things, but other people, the, the, what I want to talk about today is this depth the social influence and how profound it is, right? That not only do we do different things, we think different things. People affect the way we think, and in fact, they even affect the way we feel, right? The, 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 the effect of other people goes deep down into the human psyche, right? It affects us at a, at a very deep level, right? So this idea that we're so ultimately social and ultra-social, right, and the fact that we're affected by situations are sort of two sides of the same coin. And what I want to do is Ill just kind of go through a whole bunch of phenomena today and sort of illustrate uh, those basic points. Right, so here's a, here's a, a fun phenomenon uh, that was actually sort of predicted by one of the early uh, sort of the major figures in the psychology, uh, a guy named William James, um, who in many ways sort of lay the groundwork for modern psychology. And he talked about this interesting phenomenon he called the idea motor effect, that sometimes thinking leads directly to doing. That if I just sort of, if I get you to sort of think something, it just kind of, you, you end up doing it. Right, this really direct, almost very automatic connection. Again, there's a lot of what social psych, we're gonna talk about this in, in a couple of sessions, how much social psychology and how psychology generally now emphasizes kind of automatic behavior, that there's so many things that we do without really thinking much about them. And he was kind to make this effect. And later on, you know, much later, uh, John Barge, a, a well-known psychologist, a social psychologist at Yale, and Tanya Chartrand, one of his students, did these wonderful studies that took this idea about how people unconsciously mimic one another, 
right? That we're mimic machines. If you put people around other people, when other people do things, we sort of automatically do the same thing without thinking, right? We just, we have, we're, and we're so attuned to other people that we tend to mimic their behavior. This is a, a great example before the, one, uh, the signing of a, a peace accords. Uh, that's uh, Bill Clinton, uh, Yasser Arafat, uh, uh, the King of Jordan, uh, Hosni Mubarak, uh, Mubarak, and um, this is the Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin. Right? And you see one starts straightening their tie and the rest of them start straightening their tie at the same time. They kind of mimic each other. Uh, Barge and Chartrand tried to do that in a laboratory, right? This is what social psychologists do. They take these phenomena and they bring them in a the laboratory. And they did a really simple study where they had, uh, they put, brought a uh, subject in and they were just filling out questionnaires, doing some sort of a task right next to somebody else who was a confederate of the experimenter. And that person was, uh, you know, experimentally uh, designed to do the Confederate to exhibit one of two different behaviors. They either tended to rub their face, so the, right, so the Confederate was sitting there rubbing their face, so they were tapping their foot, right? And then they just looked at the probability that the person who they put next to them did those same behaviors. How often the, the person who was next to the person rubbed their face, rubbed their face, or tapped their foot, et cetera. And what you can see is that people tended to just sort of automatically mimic each other. So when you're next to a, when the participant was next to somebody who, uh, the confederate who was rubbing his face here on the left, they were much more likely to rub their face than to shake their foot. But when they were, uh, the confederate was next to somebody, or the participant was next to a confederate who shook their foot, they were much more likely to shake, uh, shake their foot, tap their foot than to, uh, uh, rub their face, right? So people just take on the behaviors of other people. This kind of idea of a chameleon, right? It takes on you know, uh, the, the colors of other people, right? And we do this really habitually, and in fact, it's, it has some kind of interesting long-term effects. So people have wondered for a long time, right? Why is it that married couples seem to kind of look like each other, right? People tend to start to look like each other more over time. Well, why is that? Well, part of it is this sort of habitual mimicking of each other, right? So if you see that, you know, you start to take on the facial expressions. If your, your, your uh, partner has, you know, a particular smile or a particular kind of gesture, you see it all the time, your face automatically kind of just does that. You mimic it, and so it starts to just change the architecture of your face. So it really is the case that old, that people, the longer they're married, the more they seem to look like each other to other people, right? And people have speculated that at least part of the effect is this, this kind of chronic mimicking of each other. I don't know what it explains about dogs, why people look like they're dogs. I don't know, but we'll, maybe we'll, we'll get into that. But, so this is this wonderful kind of chameleon effect, right? So it's, what it gets at is, is how, how basic this is, right? People aren't thinking about this. They're just other people do things and we tend to do the same kind of things. We're, we're kind of habitually attuned to others' behavior. Right, so we talk about conformity. It's, it's kind of a conformity, right? But when we're talking about conformity, we're talking, talking about kind of more of a thoughtful process where we have to sit there and decide, gee, I'm not going to do what other people do. But we kind of do that automatically anyway at this level, right? So that's a good example of this kind of attunement. What I want to talk about next is this idea that how this sort of social influence uh, has an impact on emotions as well. These, even these things that uh, are so fundamental to human existence. So the study of emotion, right, is one of the, uh, the oldest, uh, you know, interests of psychologists and even people before psychologists, right? And it's thought to be this really fundamental physiological process. One of the first people that was really interested in, in this was Charles Darwin. Right, so after he had written The Origin of the Species and had his uh, theory of natural selection, one of the things he wrote a book about a few years later about emotion. And one of the things he noticed is that if you look across lots and lots of different cultures, everybody seems to be, make the same facial expressions for the same emotions. Right? And again, his thought was that these things were evolved. They were these basic level kind of things that, that of course, these cultures differed in all sorts of different ways in other ways, but then somehow their facial expressions were all the same, right? And he did, there's, there's a, there, he did a little bit of this kind of research and later people have done this too. There's kind of different kinds of ways you can make this point. So get out your clickers and I just want you to do this. So you take 
Uh, and again, we're not going to talk, in the, in the text they talk a lot about what the basic kind of emotions are. There's essentially six, people, psychologists fight about this forever, right? About how many, what, how many basic emotions there are. There's about six, right, uh, that most agree on, uh, you know, happiness, anger, uh, interest, disgust, surprise, sadness, and fear. But let's just see if you can uh, uh, do this little task. So if I give you this, this is actually a, a, a man from uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, tries and he was asked to make certain kinds of faces, uh, to mimic things, and I want to see if you can guess which facial expressions he is. So in this case, he was asked, show me what your face would look like if you were about to fight. Right? So you got A, B, or C. Hopefully you can see the A, B, or C. Okay? So when, this is the way the clicker things will always go. So I'll turn on the clock. You have 30 seconds to respond. Right? So do you think it's A? If you, show me what your face would look like if you were about to fight. Which of these faces did he make? So can you guess, these are called, they're called decoding studies, right? There's two kinds of studies you can have. You can ask people to either encode an emotion, so show me the face, right? And then, or you can have people decode emotion. So tell me what this person's face is doing, right? We see it. What's it? I don't know what the time, maybe I didn't set the timer right. Well, let's see, we'll stop that, we'll do this. So almost everybody picks, 87% of you said it was A, right? 9% B, 4% C, I don't know what those people are thinking exactly, right? But you can see that you can tell kind of which one's angry, right? You can see this person, in fact, had never seen a Western human before, right? So somebody had translated for him and asked me to do this. Let's just do it one more time for yucks. Okay, to show me the face, what your face would look like if you learned that your child had just died. So which one of these faces do you think he would make if his child had just died? Hey, people, people are still chiming in. Okay. So let's see, what do we got? Up, oh, everybody gets B, right? So, you know, we can do it. I, I'm not gonna, oops. So everybody gets that right. Here's a, or, oh God. This is when I start getting confused on this, this device. And if I asked you, show me what it face like when you met friends, you'd all guess C, right? Now what's remarkable about that is if he tried to talk to you, you wouldn't understand one damn word he said, <laughs> right? And in fact, your experience is so fundamentally different, you wouldn't have any way of communicating. But you can tell exactly what he's thinking by looking at his face, right? And he could tell what you're thinking, right? If we, if we had you do the same thing, if he looked at those pictures, he could tell. And Darwin was fascinated by this. And it really, what it really suggested is that emotion is some deep physiological phenomenon, right? That if everybody shares, so one of the, you know, cultural phenomena differ across cultures. When things are these basic level, sort of species general, right, everything that all humans do together, it suggests that they're grounded somehow in physiology, right, that they're part of our really, you know, sort of really basic makeup. Right, and so that was the, the original argument. That sort of makes sense. So if you think about emotion, it's like, oh yeah, I get it, right? It's this really basic kind of physiological thing that I, I, ha I have some experience, some physiological experience, right? And I just, that tells me how I feel. But of course, psychologists have fought about the nature of emotion for a long time. Uh, and let me tell you about kind of the three sort of big theories of emotion. You know, historically speaking, the famous ones, the first was, generated by William James, uh, who we talked about before, and kind of simultaneously by a guy named Lang. It's usually referred to as the James-Lang theory of emotion. Right, so the most 
sort of the, the kind of, in, this is kind of close to the intuitive version of, of emotion, right? So most, uh, you know, um, uh, the, 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 the idea of how we experience emotion is you see some stimulus, right? Like, you know, classically a bear. So you're, a bear starts to barrel, you know, burst into this lecture hall for some reason, right? What do you do? Well, you see the bear. So your intuitive is, I get scared. Ah, bear! And I run. Right? Now James Lang theory was, was, was kind of like that. It's very close. That the idea is that you would see the environmental stimulus, right? And then he says, suggested that we had this basic physiological response, that there's this really sort of fundamental perceptual process. We would see the bear and that we would exhibit a pattern of physiological response that was unique to fear, right? So you would go, Ooh, bear, like this, and then you're shaking, right? And you go, okay, so I'm shaking, that means I'm, a, I'm afraid. And you could tell that you were afraid by this very specific pattern of physiological response that you had, right? And that would produce the experience of fear. So you see a stimulus, you have a physiological response, and you have this subjective experience of fear. If instead it was the ice cream man or somebody, you know, Oprah says, you get a prize and you get a prize and you get a prize, then you're gonna have that stimulus, this happy stimulus, it's gonna have a physiological response. It's a physiological response that is unique to happiness. Your body knows that by, by what's going on that, that you're happy and then you have this subjective experience of happiness, right? So there's this very specific physiological response that, that determines what emotion you have. That would make sense that everybody has the same physiological response, just like everybody's digestive system is put together more or less the same. You know, other systems, physiologically, humans are all very, 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 very similar, right? And so emotion, you might think of like that. Now, there's some power to this idea, right? But as more and more data was collected, it realized that it really didn't fit the pattern of data very well, right? And uh, ultimately, a, a Harvard physiologist named uh, Walter Cannon came and critiqued this theory and proposed uh, his own theory, uh, which, uh, again, simultaneously with another person named Bard, it's usually referred to as the Cannon Bard theory of emotion. And it goes something like this. So the data that he was talking about was here's the problem with, with Lang's or with James's theory, says Cannon, right? The problem is that every Emotional stimulus seems to produce exactly the same physiological response. This idea of generalized arousal. So that when you see a bear, your heart starts to beat, right? You, you breathe, you have this, you know, this re release of, uh, you know, of uh, these kind of hormones and things that get you going, right, to, to, to act. But that's exactly the same thing that happens if you are happy or if you're surprised or if you're mad, right? And Cannon says, look, you can't, it can't be that people are reading off of their bodies because every single emotion has more or less the same physiological response first. And second, according to Cannon, is it happens too slow. So the idea is if you think that it goes from, again, from stimulus to, to, to this, that this, the physiological response has to happen before this subjective experience, right? It just... Causally, it has to happen. He says, no, it doesn't happen. The problem is, is that people experience the emotion right away. You see a bear and you're going, ah! And you go, I'm scared, right? It happens just like that. But your, the physiological response doesn't happen yet, right? So how could that be, right? How could those things go? How, how do you make sense out of that? And what Cannon suggested was that these things are sort of separate. There's an environmental stimulus that it separately causes this idea of generalized arousal and then also the experience of emotion, right? And those things are separate, right? That's the only way to sort of ex account for the data according to Cannon, right? So you're in this sort of conundrum. This isn't a very satisfying idea that somehow the physiological response is completely separate from the emotion. That doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Seems that you know, that, so that suggests you could experience emotion without any arousal, without even being aroused. You could be, you know, experience emotion, and that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? In fact, there's some evidence that people who have their sort of uh, physiological arousal systems uh, damaged in some way, uh, you know, really don't report a lot of emotion sometimes, 
right? They tend to report dampened emotions. So what do you do? Well, one, there's a lot of different resolutions to this, but one really interesting sort of suggestion that has some uh, empirical data to support it was proposed by uh, two social psychologists uh, named Schachter and Singer, and it is generally referred to as the two-factor theory of emotion, right? And it's kind of interesting. They sort of take the James, they try to figure out how do you make sense of the James Lang idea that has so much power and, the, and Cannon's data that suggested this, that these emotions don't have these unique physiological effects. And so what they essentially did is was accepted Cannon Bard's notion about generalized physiological arousal. All emotions kind of are the basis of them is this generalized physiological arousal. Uh, but they also said, oh no, but James and Lang are right that that, that, that arousal is really causal, it's central. If you don't have arousal, you don't have emotion. And what they proposed was this, that there's really two factors involved in emotion, right? The first is, so you have this environmental uh, stimulus uh, which uh, produces generalized arousal, right? But there's also this idea of this, what they call the cognitive label, that you look out, that people look out on the situation and figure out, well, what the heck am I experiencing? Right, so I get this physiological arousal, what am I experiencing? There's a bear, oh, I'm scared. And if I was going physiological arousal, oh, there's the, you know, the ice cream man or whatever, I go, oh, I'm happy, right? And that somehow people are looking to the environment to interpret what emotion they're actually experiencing. Right, so the, and the idea is that it's a two-factor model because you can't have emotion if you don't have both of those factors. You have to have some generalized arousal, you have to look for a cognitive label, and then but the two of those, if you're both aroused and have an obvious label, you'll experience an emotion, right? But if, but if you don't have arousal, there's no emotion. If you don't have the label, if you don't know how to label it, then you're just gonna kinda, right, so that you don't have, you don't know what to do with it, right? And again, the idea about this cognitive label is it's really a social label. It's really the idea is that what we do very often is kind of look out into the world and see, well, what I'm feeling this thing, what do I what am I feeling? Very often what you're doing is looking at other people. What are they what are, what are they feeling? And that, that that if other people, depending on what they do, that's part of how you label how you're feeling. That there's this kind of, and there's, so there's an ability to kind of turn one emotion sort of into another by giving it a different cognitive label because they have the same generalized arousal, you can kind of move them around a little bit. So they did this very, very famous study to try and demonstrate this effect. And let me tell you uh, about this old famous study, it's Schachter and Singer study 1962. So they brought, it's a really great study, uh, you know, historically. Um, they brought people into the laboratory and they told them, well, we're interested in the effect of this drug, I think it was called Suproxen, I forget, I think that's what it was that they said. And they said, well, we're interested in how it affects your memory, your cognitive functioning, so we're gonna give you a shot of this drug, and then you gotta go and wait for a little while, and then we're gonna give you some tests and thing and see how the drug affects you, all right? So, that's the, the, the first thing they manipulated was what happened when they were giving them that drug. And what they gave them, there was no such thing as Suproxen, that isn't a real drug. What it was was epinephrine or adrenaline, right? So you everybody know what epinephrine or adrenaline does? It's basically what the body releases to generate arousal. If you shoot somebody up with adrenaline or epinephrine, they start to breathe quickly, their heart starts to palpitate, they kind of sweat a little bit, you kind of get worked up, right? So they gave, some people the drug and they told them, you know, they, everybody thought it was Suproxen, but they gave them the drug and they told them, yeah, you know, this is gonna make you feel really aroused. Your heart's gonna beat fast and everything else. Some people they told them, they're the epinephrine informed. The epinephrine ignorant people weren't told about it. They were told this wasn't gonna have any effect on them at all. They gave them the shot. Then of course later on they did this or they were given a placebo. Right, so they, they weren't given, it was a saline shot, so there was no drug involved, right? No, didn't generate any physiological arousal. So some people were manipulated to feel arousal and told that they were gonna feel arousal. Some people were manipulated to feel arousal and weren't told anything and some people weren't aroused. 
The second thing they did then was they manipulated the cognitive label, right? So what happens, they put people in a room to wait until the drug took effect so they could test them ostensibly, and they were always in there with another person. And what they did, a confederate of the experimenter again, and what they did is they manipulated what that confederate did. Right, so in some cases the confederate was euphoric. So they're supposed to be filling out this big stack of questionnaires about stuff, and he's going pop, pop, da, pop, pop, he's filling them out, da, pa, and he gets up after a little while, going, no, this is boring, I'll do the same, let's play basketball. And he crumbles up the pages of the thing, and he's going to the, you know, he's going to the waste basket. Oh, he makes the shot, you know, Kobe, oh, you know, he's doing his thing, and he's, he's bouncing around, he's acting all euphoric, right? And in another condition, other, other subjects, saw something different. They saw a confederate who was anger, is muttering, God, I hate this damn this experiment. What are we doing? You know, this is so stupid. I can't believe they're asking me these personal questions. Right? So he's grumbling. And then, after they wait in this room for a while, they then ask people to self-report on their emotions. Ask the subject, after he's experienced all this, what kind of emotion is he going to feel? Right? And what they found was this very nice effect that was perfectly consistent with their theories, right? You have to have the two factors to get the emotion. So in the epinephrine informed condition, people already had a label, they had the arousal, they're aroused, but they already have a label for it. They know that the drug made them aroused, right? So they actually didn't report any differences in emotion. When you look at them across, they, were, they really reported very similar kinds of emotion. In the placebo group, there's no arousal. Right? There's nothing to explain or to think about, so they really don't show differences in emotion. Where you, the only place where you get these differences in emotion is in the epinephrine ig ignorant group, right? So those, all these people are feeling aroused, bop, bop, da, bop, ba, you know, and they're, 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 you know, their heart's beating and everything, and what they're going is, what is this that I'm feeling? So when they're around somebody that's happy, they're going, yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, this person's happy. Yeah, I, 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 I get it, I'm happy. And they started, you know, and then when they report their emotion, they report being happy. The people who experience somebody who's angry look around and say, what am I feeling? Yeah, I'm pretty pissed off. This is, this is a crappy questionnaire. My favorite question on the question, I have to tell you, that was on all of them, it was, <laughs> it was, how many men other than your husband has your mother slept with? Four or less was the best option you could give, right? It was like four or less, you know, five to eight, eight to nine, right? So the best you could do is, hey, my mom's only slept with less than four other people, right? So there was things in there that could kind of, everybody saw this, but right, there were things in there you could kind of generate something from it all, right? So that's, so the, so the idea is that these emotions could be changed. There's, the emotions are social. What other people are doing can change how it is that you feel, what you're actually experiencing as an emotion, right? So the very same thing, that arousal, can be interpreted in different ways. Right, as anger and or as happiness, right? But if you don't have the arousal, there's no emotion. If you know how to label the arousal, right? So this is the idea that if, you know, the, the epinephrine informed is kind of like the bear condition, right? So the bear runs in and you're not going, you know it's fear, right? Because it's very clear. It's like, I'm feeling all this and there's a freaking bear chasing me. I'm pretty sure I'm angry that I'm not in love, right? <laughs> That this, you know, this, this palpitation isn't love, I'm, I'm scared. So look, sometimes what's causing your emotion is very clear, right? And so you won't get these kind of social effects. But when you're experiencing certain kinds of things, and it's not clear, we look to other people to tell us what's going on. Just like we do in the ASH studies or anything else. You look to see what other people are doing, right? And how they're feeling. And in fact, it can actually affect how you experience emotion. Right? So this basic idea, you know, it was a very intriguing experiment, very clever. The problem is it's probably wrong at some deep level, right? It's not, there, there, there's this, this is probably not a good theory of emotion in general, right? Uh, the, actually, the data turned out to be a, a little bit weakish, although you can see how it was so clever that it takes on all this power, right? It's interesting, I'll just do really quickly what, what, the, what the actual answer to the question is, is that probably James and Lang were really right at some level, but they were looking at the wrong place. So what a lot of research seems to suggest now is that there are very unique physiological reactions that are associated with each emotion. But they're not down here. They're up here. It's, it's in your face, right? So your face, the reason we have those things, your face actually encodes emotions. 
right? So when you see a bear, you go, and everybody does, and then you read off of those, that physiological reaction tells you you're afraid, right? When you're happy, right? So if you make people do fun, you know, fun things like, uh, you know, mimic those emotions, they'll actually very often experience those emotions, right? So it's kind of an interesting thing. What's powerful, though, about this shackered singer notion, it does capture something that's really real, which is that there's a real transfer of, of arousal, that, that these emotions can kind of, you know, meld into each other in various ways. People have said that, you know, that there's a thin line between love and hate. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, that you, it's easy, if you really love somebody, it's really easy to really hate them too, right? Because you have all this emotion and it can kind of transfer itself. That arousal can move from one thing to another. And we sometimes confuse uh, the, the, what we're experiencing, one emotion for another. Wonderful example of this in a more recent uh, study is this, uh, is this uh, bridge study. And let me just tell you about it by, by Dutton and Aaron. I'm going to show you a little two minute video that describes the study and it captures this idea of how emotions can be and arousal in particular can be interpreted in different ways. Let's just is just the place to put Art Aaron's theory to the test. The danger can provoke passion. We had an attractive young woman stand on this scary bridge, and every time a young man would walk across by himself, she would stop him and say, excuse me. I'm doing an experiment for my psychology class on the effects of exposure to scenic attractions on creative expression. Would you mind filling out this questionnaire for me, please? There's a pen. Almost all the men agreed to do it. After all, it was an attractive woman asking the man to do something. They didn't want to admit they were scared. And then I have a picture for you to look at. And I'd like for you to write a brief dramatic story based on this photograph. So the man would write the story. And when he was done, she'd say, Thank you. I appreciate your time. And I would love, I don't have a whole lot of time now, but I'd love to explain um, the experiment in more detail when I do have more time. So, um, I'm going to give you my number, and you can feel free to call me. It's at the hotel. Okay. So she would write her name and phone number on the edge of her little sheet, tear it off, and hand it to her. Great. My name's Linda, so um, okay. I hope you call me. Okay, Linda. She stopped 20 men on the scary bridge, and then she stopped another 20 men on another bridge that was a big, heavy, safe bridge, not very scary at all. I'm doing a project for my psychology class on the effects of exposure to see. Of the men who met her on the scary bridge, many more phoned her that night than the ones who met her on the safe bridge. The other thing we did is we looked at the stories they wrote. Far more romantic and sexual content when they met the woman on the scary bridge. She's embarrassed because her boyfriend wants to marry her. Than when they met the very same woman on the safe bridge. I think this woman is a little embarrassed about something that's really not that important at all. Aaron believes that when our heart is pounding in our chest, we unconsciously look for the most attractive explanation. And if an attractive person of the right sex is standing by, then we're happy to assume we've fallen in love. I just incredibly clever study, a real study that was done, it's just a dramatization of it, right? But again, this, this sort of Shacker and Singer two-factor theory is probably not a, it's, it's not a comprehensive theory of emotion, but it captures this really interesting idea that they capture, that we can sort of confuse these things. It's often referred to as excitation transfer, right? So you get excited about something and then you mistake it for something else. Right, and that these emotions can kind of blend. If you can see, you know, you see this dramatized on TV a lot. Everybody gets angry at each other, and then they, oh, you know, they fall into, a, you know, and kiss. There's some power to that, right? There's some reality to that that these things can happen. That we and interpret things kind of based on, you know, where we're at. We look around and decide how we're feeling, right? So again, you know, the moral of the story applied psychology is if you really have somebody you're attracted to, right, and you want to, you know, you know jumpstart your romantic attraction, don't take them to a romantic movie, take them to a scary movie. Because scary movies, you get all aroused and it's very easy to sort of transfer those. Or not easy, but it's possible to transfer those emotions, right? So again, that's a good example. So what I, what I wanted to stress in this part is that other people, sort of, we looked at other people to inform things that it can affect not just what we do, but what we think, and even how we feel about things. So that's how deep down social influence goes. 
Any questions about that? And again, anytime you guys have questions during class, shoot the hand up. What I want to do now is just sort of segue a little bit and talk about this, really the same kind of concepts, but talk about it in the context of group dynamics and, and just this general effect, lots of different effects that have been documented in social psychology about how other people and the presence of other people changes the things that we do in uh, interesting ways, right? So people often behave in groups. And social psychologists use groups in a couple different ways. Groups kind of in the loosest sense, like we're a group. We're all together, right? We're also in a class that has some identity, so we're a sort of part of a, you can see there's sort of a gradation of that, right? So we're in a class, you know, we, we uh, you know, are in this uh, P11C class, and, and so we have some identity like that. But if, you know, somebody wanted to challenge us and fight, if another, you know, if the P11B class wanted to fight, you know, you guys might all go, screw it, I'm not, I'm not fighting for you. Ditto, you know, I don't even know you, right? But if this was your religious group or your ethnic group or a group of people who you were in an army unit with or people who you voluntarily associated with, all those things just get even more powerful, right? So this identity, when we think of ourselves as a group, right, things get more powerful. But many of the same effects you can see, you know, when, when we think about groups, teams, tribes interacting with each other, you can see sort of similar things, the basis of them, just in any kind of group. We're very groupy, right? We tend to sort of connect with the, whoever we're with because that's our sort of deeply ingrained sort of human nature, right, to be groupy. So I want to talk about this idea that there's three kind of effects that groups, you know, being in the presence of other people tends to have on us. They tend to cause arousal, tend to cause anonymity, and tends to cause extremization. I'm kind of, you kind of whip through a bunch of kind of experimental uh, examples of these things. So get out your clickers. Let me ask you just one quick question here. So do you think having an audience usually helps you perform better or perform worse? Do you think, like if you're going to do some task, do you think you do better if you're just alone, nobody's watching you, or if there's other people watching you do this thing, right? So A, better, B, makes you perform worse, C, it doesn't have any effect on you at all. So which do you think of those is true? Being in a group make you perform better, worse, or doesn't have any effect? A, B, or C? All right, 29, 30, come on, 152, now we got one more, okay. Three, okay. Gotta fix that so there's some time. And what do you get? So, again, pretty evenly split. About 41% of you said that it makes you perform better. About 54% of you said it makes you perform worse, 15% says it doesn't anything. So which of these two is, is correct? They're both right. It makes you perform better and worse, depending on the situation, right? This actually goes back to the very, very first, which generally acknowledges the very first social psychology experiment. The first person to ever decide, well, gee, I see some social phenomenon out there. I'm going to try and study it in the laboratory. It was a guy named Norman Triplett in, 19, in 1898. He was at Indiana University. Professor, like a lot of professors, he was kind of a sports nerd. Like he liked to do things, right? Like a lot of professors like baseball because baseball is like really statistical and you can like, do all sorts of things. You know, they're really into it. He was a, happened to be a bicyclist. He was an avid, you know, when he wasn't uh, working as a professor, he was a bicyclist. And so he liked to keep all the statistics and how fast everybody went. And he noticed this funny phenomenon when he was doing that, which is that when people, the, there were three kinds of ways that people went out and did their, their bike rides. They either did it alone, they did it in some kind of a race against other people, or they did it when they were you know, together, but they weren't racing, what they called paced. You had somebody pacing you, going with you. And what he found was there was this really interesting phenomenon such that people tended to perform uh, about 20% uh, better, right? They, uh, they went faster when they were performing in either a competition or if they were paced than if they were alone. People rode those this same distance faster if they had somebody else with them. And it, so you can see it's, it's uh, 220, 220, 2 minutes and 29 seconds a mile if you're unpaced. But if you're paced, it goes to 155. And if you're paced competition, it goes to 150. And he was really interested in those first two. Why is it just with having somebody next to you 
Why does that make you go faster? Right? The competition you kind of get, you're racing, right? But why is it just having somebody else there makes you go faster? He said, well, I wonder if that's a general phenomenon. He decided to bring it into the laboratory and see, because there's lots of different people. people. Some people might choose to, faster people might want to choose to be in the competition, right? And then slower people don't want to compete. So there's all sorts of differences. But he said, well, I'm going to bring it into a laboratory where I can control everything. I can randomly assign people to condition, which is this crucial sort of experimental uh, you know, uh, uh, procedure, right? So that, that people just get placed in the condition. So you know it's just not people choosing. And he did this funny thing where he said, well, I can't have people riding bikes around the Indiana psychology department, right? What can I do? Well, he created a, game, a, a, a task that he thought was very similar to bike riding in the sense that it was you know, very simple. And it was just rolling up, it was taking on, a, you know, it was this apparatus that he built where two people could sit, there were two uh, 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 fishing reels, and you had to, your chore was to you know, reel that line all the way up onto, onto your thing, right? And do it as fast as you could. And so he had some people do it alone. These were kids mostly that he brought in. And he had other kids do it when there was just somebody else there, right? And sometimes they weren't competing, right, at all. There was just somebody else there. Right? And what he found, really interestingly, was almost exactly the same finding as he found, as he saw in the statistics, the bike riding statistics, right? That kids, when they had somebody else next to them, tended to roll that string up about 20% faster, right? Just by having the presence of other people there. They did better. Right, so he came up with this idea, this name for it that he called social facilitation. That have, in a social situation that facilitates performance. Right, that people do better, they ride faster, they, ride, they wind up string faster. They, they do better on these kind of tasks when they're with other people, it facilitates performance. Now, you may be thinking, well that's not particularly how the, the, the 54% of you that said you did worse, right? You're thinking of things like, oh, you know, I can just do, you know, I can give my speech fine uh, to a mirror, but when I'm in front of the, the rest of the crowd, I screw up. Or, you know, you think about the Olympics, right? That's always kills me about the Olympic gymnastics and things like that. You know these people have done, and ice skating, right? You know they've done that routine a thousand times just fine, and they get in front of the people and they fall down, right? So why is it? So sometimes there's this intuition, right, that, that performance gets worse. Right, and so as research accumulated, they, they captured that well. And this social facilitation sort of, this, we still use the same name, but uh, work by Bob Zients, that's how you say that, it rhymes with science, very famous social psychologist, old friend of mine, just passed away a few years ago, did this wonderful, famous research to try and, how is it that sometimes other people can make things go well, sometimes they can make them go poorly? And so what he talked about is essentially what happens is when you're in the presence of other people, it makes you aroused. And what arousal does is it, it, what he called is it increases the probability of a dominant response. It says organisms are really fundamentally geared that when they're aroused, they do kind of the thing that they almost always do, right? They do things kind of the habitual way, uh, you know, it tends to strengthen whatever their dominant response is in that situation. And so his real insight was to say, well, sometimes a dominant response makes things go well and sometimes it makes things go poorly. So if it's a simple task, there on the left, Right, the dominant response is to do it right. The dominant response is just to ride that bit, damn bike, you've done it a hundred times, right? it's simpler, ride that thing. That tends to make you do it better and go better. But on a complicated task, like giving a speech or doing something you're really not well practiced at, that dominant response is kind of to screw up. And so you tend to screw up. It makes you uh, do worse. So you do, so arousal being in the presence of others makes people do simple tasks better, but complicated tasks worse. But again, it all has to do with in the presence of other people, we get aroused and it has these interesting effects. This effect's been demonstrated many, many, many times with people, right, where you give them simple puzzles to solve and other people make, the presence of other people makes them do it better, complicated, does it worse. But what was interesting about Bob Zions is he wanted to, he really again thought people were these social animals, right? And he said, you know, this isn't just a human thing, this is a really basic physiological response that almost any organism will show. Right? And he wanted to, so how did he go about proving that? Well, he created a cockroach stadium. 
So he brought in the simplest, stupidest looking animal he could possibly think of. The ugliest, most vile thing, a cockroach. And he said, I bet cockroaches do the same thing. And so he built this apparatus. So essentially what it was was a simple maze. You flash a light. If you have had cockroaches, you flash a light. What do they do? They run away. Right? So he flashed a light at one end and then saw if they could uh, run the other. Right? And so he did, he constructed one simple maze where all the cockroach had to do, you flash a light at one end and it has to run straight down to the goal. Or a complicated one, complicated for a cockroach, right? It had to have the light flash and it had to turn right to go to the goal. Simple one, complicated one, and the clever thing is he built little cockroach seats, little stadium seats. So they either did that alone, no the cockroaches around, or they were, oh, those little, little cockroaches were sitting there, you know, big cheese heads and, woo, you know, painted on their chest. So, oh, so they were sitting there cheering for him, right? <laughs> or just sitting there mostly. Um, and what he found was exactly what he suspected, right? So on the simple task, the, the cockroaches tend to do a little bit better, when, it was a really simple task, right? They tend to do a little bit better if there was an audience and if they were alone, that's that bottom blue line, I don't have a light on this thing. Uh, and if they were, but if it was a complicated task, so they did it faster, right? So it took them less time to get straight up, but if it was a complicated task, it took them more time, right? So the presence of other cockroaches made them do it worse, right? So again, it suggests that the effect isn't all just sort of evaluating, so people think it's all, oh, I'm really afraid, when you think about it yourself, right, I'm going to give a speech, I'm afraid I'm going to screw up and all the people are going to think I'm stupid, right? So that evaluation apprehension, that's real, that, that torques the phenomenon up, but the phenomenon happens even without that. You can't really imagine the cockroach just going, oh, you know, Carrie Cockroach is never going to sleep with me if I can't do this, uh, you know, thing right, you know, so everything's on the line, this is my chance, my 15 minutes of cockroach fame. Um, so that, it's just sheer arousal, right? This idea of arousal. That's one thing that being around other people kind of arouses us and has just, and that, again, we know already that arousal creates emotions and all sorts of things that intensifies things. So one thing that being around other people does is it arouses us, it generates arousal. And this social facilitation is a wonderful phenomenon, uh, uh, you know, example of this. Second, so that's arousal. And it's, but we know that this idea that being around people has effects has been, is really one of the older ideas in psychology. We talked about it when we talked about Plato's notion, right? That, you know, he had this other idea that if every Athenian citizen had been a Socrates, every Athenian assembly would still have been a mob. That there's been this insight since Plato and, you know, came to really full fruition with Gustav Le Bon wrote a, a book about the psychology of the crowd, this idea about mob behavior that somehow when people are with other people they act in these kind of mobbish ways, right? And part of that is arousal, right? They get aroused and they, they you know, they, they you know, may experience emotions more intensely, but they also seem to do things that they would never do in other situations, right? They behave badly. We just, uh, you know, uh, saw a little bit, I guess, in Ohio State and Columbus, they kind of, after the football game, they won the college national championship, they, they, they rampage. You know, that seems to happen a lot. You get people into groups and they tend to sort of do things that they would normally not do, right? Sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's not quite so bad, but you can see the phenomenon. And what at least part of this sort of crowd phenomenon is, is the sense of when we're in a group, we become kind of immersed in the group and we lose our sense of individuality, right? We lose a sense of ourselves as a, as a person who can be identified and is responsible for the things that we do and we tend to sort of merge in this interesting way with the crowd. We, 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 it causes this sense of anonymity, right? That when we're anonymous, when we feel like we're in a crowd, we can't really be identified in some ways, right? We can't be individuated then it has this kind of releasing effect on our behavior. We tend to do things that we might want to do but would normally not do, right? There's a whole bunch of interesting examples of this phenomenon. The sort of most, sort of, uh, the, the concept that's at the center of a lot of this work is what's called de-individuation. It was really originally developed by Phil Zimbardo. Um, and he was the, the, you know, did some of the early experiments on it and some really clever stuff. And again, some of it was 
captured in this idea of the prison experiment, right? So one of the things that he noticed is that these guards really like these mirrored sunglasses when nobody can see your eyes. I love mirrored sunglasses, right? Nobody knows where your eyes are looking. You can kind of, you know, you feel the sense of you can't be identified in some sense. And he said that was part of what the sense that they couldn't, that the guards felt like they just blended in with everybody else. They couldn't be identified, had this kind of sense of increasing their brutal behavior. And Phil Zimbardo sort of took that idea and said, well, this is a more general phenomenon that you see lots of times that people feel like they can't be, that they feel de-individuated, like they can't be picked out of a crowd, right? This immersion in a group, or if you're other, disguised or otherwise unidentifiable to others, right? So that's the thing, is if I can't tell who you are, if you feel like I can't tell who you are, it tends to release you to do things you wouldn't normally do, right? So at Halloween, you might right, notice Halloween's like one of the best kind of parties usually. Uh, another th example, I did this one time this, at Mardi Gras uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I was in Mardi Gras for uh, New Orleans. That's actually me on the right top with my mask, right? You had this great sense of, oh, you know, I can do what I want. I can think, you know, things can, things can happen. And that, when you, when you feel like you're masked and, and, and anonymous, right, it tends to have this releasing effect. So the, again, being immersed in a group can do that, being disguised can do that. What it tends to do is lessen your sense of self, lessen the sense of accountability to others, lower shame, guilt, fear, responsibility. And what it produces is things, impulsive behavior. People do the things that they want to do very often. Again, that's a little different from conformity, right? Conformity is you do things you might not want to do, but other people do. But what, with the sense of not being able to pick out makes people more impulsive, more irrational, more emotional, sometimes more conforming, because very often other people are doing all the same things you want to do. Right? And there's lots of great sort of examples of that kind of releasing effect that happens in groups. One of them was that wonderful social contagion example I gave you. Right? What's kind of neat about that thing is if you, for those of you who are early, there's one guy dancing. He looks like he's just having a great time. He's at some festival, the kind of music festivals you guys go to. Then all of a sudden, you know, it takes a while. It takes a couple minutes to get the first person, another person to join him. And then it happens really quickly after that. All of a sudden there's two, there's three, there's five, there's 10, there's 20, there's 40. They all just join because they're looking like, at first it's going, oh, that guy's doing kind of fun stuff, but it you know, looks like kind of a dork. I don't know if I want to do that. You know, people are going to be looking at me. Then more and more people go, you go, yeah, all those other people are doing this. And now there's a whole bunch of people, and I really want to do that too. I've wanted to do it from the start, but I was afraid. And then they all jump in, right, and do it. That kind of, that social behavior tends to con be contagious. It catches on. Another great example that you guys might have experienced. Have you ever been waiting at a... Across the, bless you. Have you ever been waiting to, uh, you're waiting to go across the crosswalk? You know, it's red. There's no, you're in a big city, you know, or something. There's a lot of people coming. You're standing there going, God, I should just walk across. I should just walk across, right? And all of a sudden, one person just goes, <laughs> right? Starts to walk, and then everybody goes, ah. Oh. You know, it's this releasing effect, right? One person does it. It's like, oh, I can do that. Another person, as soon as there's like three or four people, everybody just does it, right? You wanted to do it anyway. Right? And, then, and the more, the bigger the crowd is, the more like, the more anonymous you feel, the more likely these things are to happen. And there's like, you know, so de-individuation can do this, can kind of facilitate this sort of sense of you doing what you want. It's a wonderful study that was done by a guy named Ed Diener, again in ha Halloween, really simply. It's described in your text. I'll do it really fast here. Uh, they, they looked, uh, they created a situation on Halloween where they were, uh, people came to the, uh, regular old trick-or-treaters came to the door. Uh, some came just naturally, individually, by themselves. Some came in groups of kids. On top of that, for half the kids, they said, hey, what's your name? Hi, happy, you know, happy Halloween, what's your name? Or they didn't do that, they individuated them, or they left them anonymous. And then, once they greeted them, they gave them a piece of candy, and they, they left, or I think, what, yeah, they, they, in some cases, they, they left the candy there to be taken. Right? They left a bowl of candy there that, that they could take more, and then they, you know, they, they left and walked away. And what they found is they were interested in how often, you know, everybody wants the candy, so how likely am I to help myself to extra candy? Well, if I'm alone, I'm not very likely to do it. Uh, you know, uh, I'm a little bit more likely if I'm, particularly if I'm alone and individuated, the one on the left, if I'm alone, nobody knows what I am, a little bit more. In groups, if you're individuated, it kind of brings it back down, but in, when you're in groups, right, nobody knows who you are, it's like, you're going to know who took the candy. I just kind of want some candy. Uh, I take it. So people are more likely to kind of do the things they want to do and release in that sense. Another good example, this is uh, just to give a, a, where this has been extended to something that's called suicide baiting. 
right? The notion that sometimes you'll see somebody on a, a ledge and you get somebody in the crowd, some idiot in the crowd going, ah, jump! Come on, dude, we chicken? Right? Horrible behavior. So what predicts it? Well, they, they uh, analyzed real behavior uh, and looked at situations where the crowd in a city where there was somebody uh, trying to commit suicide and whether suicide baiting occurred or not. And the two things that they found were relevant were if there's a crowd of more than 300 or less than 300, the bigger the crowd, the more likely somebody was to suicide bait. The, if it was dark rather than light, the more likely they were to suicide bait, right? So when you can't be identified because there's either too many people or they can't see you, people are more likely to kind of just, they have this impulse and to act on it, like to just sort of free them up to do the things that they want to do. Right? All examples of that same thing. When you're feeling like it, when you're in a group, you tend to become immersed in it, right? And it's, it's going to happen even to groups like this, but the more you are sort of feeling even in a sense of identity, to the group, like the more you sort of lose your individual identity and it tends to make people kind of do what they want to do. And very often what they want to do, everybody kind of wants to do the same thing, so you get this kind of rush of people to do and act these behaviors. Let me take, I'm not going to get all the way through this lecture, I don't think today, so let me just talk about one other example of how groups can do these kind of funny things to people in even more complicated ways and use it as an excuse to talk about really one of the more famous set of studies in uh, the history of social psychology, the st studies on what's called uh, the bystander effect in helping. How many people have heard about these studies before? This is actually done by uh, one of my uh, advisors at uh, in graduate school at Princeton named John Darley was, and Bib Latine were the two people, psychologists who did this work and it was really interesting. It has, it has the flavor of a lot of social psychological work which is that it's inspired by real world events. And this was inspired by the example of a uh, uh, woman named Kitty Genovese, or Kitty Genovese, who was, um, in 1964, she was coming back from work uh, late at night to her apartment building in New York City. She was attacked by a man with a knife who, uh, again, she was screaming. He was trying to drag her off. Uh, and stabbing at her, she's going, oh, you know, he's, he's, he's hurting me, he's killing me, she's screaming, right? The neighbor's lights go on, he leaves for a little while, he comes back again when she's still laying on the ground and continues to stab her, ultimately killing her. The whole thing goes on for quite a while, half an hour, 45 minutes or so. When the police investigated, afterwards they found that at least 38 people of her neighbors heard their screams and not one of them lifted the telephone to call the police, right? They didn't do anything. People were shocked when this said, this made a big cultural splash. They said, oh, here's the problem. Here's New York, this callous, horrible city. These people, how could these people be these terrible, dehumanized that they wouldn't help somebody? They heard somebody screaming and they wouldn't do anything, right? Now it happens all the time, and you, you, you see examples of this frequently. I'll play this anyway, just for, even though we don't have much, we only have nine minutes left, but I'll do it. It gives you an example, another example of this it's happening. A good Samaritan on the this is a little scary, States guys, so a little graphic, just so you know, disturbing. For helping, no one steps up for him with tragic consequences. Global Nationalist Paul Johnson has the story, and a warning, some viewers may find the pictures disturbing. Police say he was a good Samaritan. 31-year-old Hugo Tailed Yaks stabbed as he tried to protect a woman from a mugger. This surveillance tape shows him bleeding to death on the sidewalk as 25 people passed him by. In that hour and 20 minutes, one man takes a cell phone picture, another actually lifts his body, sees the blood, and walks away. By the time paramedics got there, it was too late. Anybody that would do that and just leave them there to die, that's no morals, you know? No morals, no conscience. Shocking, but hardly uncommon. In Hartford, Connecticut, a 78-year-old man who was hit by a car died after countless others passed him by. A patient who collapsed in the waiting room of this New York psych ward was left face down for an hour before she died with staff and other patients looking on. 
A lot of you are probably thinking, not me. If I saw something like that happening, I would jump in and help. But statistically speaking, you wouldn't, especially if there were a lot of other people around. There's an assumption that someone else must be helping out. We're motivated to try to fit into our social environment. We're influenced by others. Uh, we want to do what others do. Our behavior will follow. It's known as the bystander effect. The more people present, the less likely anyone will step forward and do something. The stabbing murder of Kitty Genovese in New York in 1964 is one of the most famous examples. But in 2002, Canadians were horrified by the murder of Brienne Voth early one morning in Port Coquitlam. Some neighbors who heard her screams didn't call 911. Actual, good Samaritans are rarer than you'd think. And last week in New York, Hugo Tail Yanks seems to have been the only one who deserved that title. Paul Johnson, Global News, Washington. So you probably experienced this. You've seen news stories like this before, right? It seems that you go, wow, these horrible people, why would they do that? Right? And that's in, in 1964, that's what everybody was doing, right? About Kitty Jamie. They were saying, You're, those are terrible people. You're terrible people. Everybody except for John Darley and Bib Latinay, they had a very different sense. They said, yeah. I think it's the situation that's doing it. And in fact, the thing that everybody says, how could all those people see this happen and not do anything? John Darling and Bib Latin looked at it and said, the reason that all those people didn't do anything is because exactly because there were so many people there. Right? So the idea is, and it has many different effects, but the, the notion really is that if you see something like this happening, at the time it's much more ambiguous than you would imagine. And people said things like, well, I thought maybe maybe it was some weird sex fantasy they were playing out, or I really doesn't, didn't know what was happening. But then they would also say things like, oh, you know, and then I saw all the other lights went on, and I'm sure somebody must have, I, I knew somebody must have picked up the phone. Like somebody must have done something, right? I, I didn't have, so nobody wants to call. They don't want to get involved. And if they don't feel like the responsibility is solely on them, like they could be identified and it, it's really them, they're likely, you, you uh, experience a phenomenon that's, that's generally referred to as diffusion of responsibility. Right? So you say, well, somebody else will take the responsibility, surely. And everybody thinks the same thing. And so nobody ends up doing anything. And it's the fact that if it was just one person and you came across this, you'd be more likely to help than in fact there were lots of people. Because we sort of look to other people, we, we, we decide our behavior based on what's going on, and if we don't want to do it, right, we assume maybe somebody else will. Let me just get really quickly, I'm going to give you a five minutes, I've got five minutes, I'll give you a five minute explanation of this wonderful experiment. What they did, based on this Kitty Genovese situation, is they went in and tried to recreate emergency situations in the laboratory to test their theories. That's what social psychologists do. They aren't content to just speculate, they want to test them. So this is often referred to as the epileptic seizure study. So they brought the students in, they told them it was a group discussion of the problems adjusted to college life. Each of them was, in a, they said oh, we want to keep you sort of anonymous, so you're each in separate booths, but you could hear each other and you could talk that way. They would take turns talking, the experimenter wasn't listening at all, so it was just the people in the group. And then all of a sudden, one of the subjects who uh, mentions that she has a problem with seizures. She says, she talks about how she's had these problems with seizures that get uh, more intense when she gets anxious, and she's been having a little bit of a problem with this since she's been in college, and all of a sudden she goes into the, and this is the verbatim in the paper, I, er, um, I think, I, I need, er, er, if, could, er, somebody, er, 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 give me some, a little, er, give me a little, er, give me a little help here because I'm, er, I, I, I'm chokes then quiet. That's the way they describe it. Now, I don't, I'm not making fun of this at all, right? That's, so she went through what seemed very clearly to be an epileptic seizure. After she said she was already susceptible, the question is, did anybody help? Did anybody get out of their booth and go to talk to the experimenter? That's what they were interested in. And again, what they did is they manipulated how many other subjects were there that everybody believed were there, right? And there's really, everybody's an individual subject because everybody's not, Right, they know how many other people are there, right, or how many other people they think are there. And they manipulate that. So again, some people thought it was just the, the person who had the epileptic seizure and them, two people. Some people thought it was the person who had the seizure themselves and another person. And some people thought there were six people total, them, themselves, and then four other people, right? And then they, what they were interested in is, 
what percentage of people helped and how much time it took them to help. And you see this exactly this diffusion of responsibility phenomenon that they were interested in, that people were much more likely to help, uh, over 80% of them helped if they thought they were the only other one there. The responsibility, they were the only one that heard this, they felt like they had to do something. When they thought there was one other person, it dropped all the way down to 60%. If they thought there were four other people around, it dropped all the way to 30%. Right? 70% of the people didn't ever get up. In six minutes they gave them, never got up out of their chair. How fast did they do it? Well, again, it's that same phenomenon. When there's only two people there, they did it very quickly, on average within 50 seconds. Uh, if there was another person, they delayed them, which delay can, in emergencies, right, can almost always be the real problem. Even if you do it eventually, if you don't do it fast enough, right, and so they, it's almost 100 seconds and then if there are six people on average took over 150 seconds, almost two minutes to do anything, right. So again, it's this idea that you think that if somebody doesn't help, it's them, you're a bad person. But it depends on the situation, right, and it depends on what you think is going on. You assume all these other people must have done something so you don't do it. Right? It's a more situated, more social explanation for these kind of lapses that the kind that we want to say that people don't have any morals, right? So think about that. On Tuesday, we'll come back, we'll talk a little bit more about extremization, and we're going to talk about persuasion and attitude change. Have a great weekend. We'll see you guys on Tuesday.